a lot of YA novels are usually like snip snap, Mm -hmm. but they're, you know, quick and and dirty. Well, not dirty. Um, (laughs) You you know what I mean? Like they get, they get in, they get out, they get it all done. Welcome to BYOB, the Bring Your Own Book podcast. I'm Nikki. I'm Kelly. And I'm Tilly. In this episode, we're talking about one of my favorite books, the popular paranormal mystery YA novel, The Diviners by Libba Bray, which was published in 2012. Here's the publisher's synopsis from Kelly. Evie O'Neill has been exiled from her boring old hometown and shipped off to the bustling streets of New York City, and she is positively ecstatic. It's 1926, and New York is filled with speakeasies, Ziegfeld girls, and rakish pickpockets. The only catch is that she has to live with her Uncle Will and his unhealthy obsession with the occult. Evie worries her uncle will discover her darkest secret, a supernatural power that has only brought her trouble so far. But when the police find a murdered girl branded with a cryptic symbol and Will is called to the scene, Evie realizes her gift could help catch a serial killer. As Evie jumps headlong into a dance with a murderer, other stories unfold in the city that never sleeps. A young man named Memphis is caught between two worlds. A chorus girl named Theta is running from her past. A student named Jericho is hiding a shocking secret. And unknown to all, something dark and evil has awakened. Ooh, doesn't it just (laughs) sound so good? It was I mean, we know it's it's good because we read it. (laughs) great synopsis (laughs) i know i'm just so excited and now tilly is going to introduce the drink we've chosen yeah so the drink we've chosen to pair with this episode is called the bee's knees (laughs) and it's made with gin lemon and honey a classic prohibition era cocktail with a fabulous 1920s name we just thought it would be exactly the sort of drink evie would love (laughs) are we ready to try everybody yeah, it looks delicious. It this is does. Be strong. It's prohibition era. Yes, oh, girl. Boy. <laughs> <laughs> that bathtub gin. That's what they used to do back oh. then, I think, right? Yes. <laughs> oh, God. Okay. Cheers. 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 <sighs> yeah. Delicious. I'm, I know you love gin, Tilly. It's never been one of my faves, yeah. but. <laughs> I definitely like gin, but it's going to make me thirsty for the rest of this episode. I'm going to be like, Oh, God. We apologize for that <laughs> Okay, great. Now that we're all set up, we know the basic premise of the book, and we have our drink. We're going to give our star ratings out of five. Obviously, we say this every time. We all have a different way of rating, but that's how Goodreads rates it, and it kind of gives everybody a little bit of a a signal as to where we're at at the end of, of reading this book. So, Kelly, why don't you go first? So I gave this a four and a half out of five. I was really excited to read this because I know that you've been talking about this for a while and that you love this book. And so I was like, okay, cool. Like I'm down for YA paranormal activity (laughs) of sorts, I guess, (laughs) if you will. And um, I was pleasantly surprised by this book because I didn't go in thinking it wasn't going to be good, but like, I didn't know what sort of book this was going to be. And it was very dark. It was very well researched uh, to the point where I found myself at times tabbing things and thinking like, is this what happened back then? Is this what happened? And I was very intrigued Mm -hmm. by just how much research Libba Bray had done. And so I thought her author's note was really interesting to read at the end of the book. I also Mm -hmm. really cared about a lot of the characters. I thought the villain was super creepy and the murders Mm -hmm. were so disgusting and detailed. I was like, oh my God, it was like reading a ghost story. But having all said that, I gave it a four and a half because I did find for me, there were like some pacing things where I wished it would have just like kept up, I guess, but I listened to the audiobook while I read the ebook and I had a great time. So four and a half out of five. Awesome. What about you, Tilly? What did you think? Yeah, I really enjoyed it as well. I ended up giving it a four out of five. Um, I thought it was a super gripping read, totally swept me away into the roaring Mm twenties. And um, a lot of Evie's like lingo and vocabulary choices made me cackle. They were so (laughs) funny. Um, 
I thought she was a really great protagonist. I thought the plot really kept me on my toes. It was really scary. Mm-hmm. There were a few times where I was reading it at night and I thought, I should go into a lighted room. <laughs> a lighted? Lit? Lit room. I should turn on a lamp. <laughs> and I thought the writing was funny and sometimes really poignant mm-hmm. and often just really scary. So I really enjoyed the story. Um, I thought it had great setup for the rest of the series. Mm -hmm. And I'm excited to read more. I think what made me give it a four rather than a five was uh, there were just some like character things that I maybe didn't quite understand. Um, I I assume that's probably because things will get explained more in the next two books. Like it definitely really read as a setup. Mm -hmm. Um, But I, yeah, I I really enjoyed it overall. I had a great time reading. Awesome. Yeah, I, uh, this is my second time reading this book. And the first time I read it, I gave it a four out of five. Um, I think probably for similar reasons to the two of you, uh, there were some things with pacing where I felt like it was dragging a little bit, obviously not too much because I still really enjoyed it. And I sped through the book. I think I read it the first time in like three days. Oh my and, God, it's um, long. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it is pretty long, especially for a YA book. But reading it the second time, and already knowing all of these characters and being able to just enjoy and understand more why these things are happening because I already know where the book is going. I gave Mm -hmm. it a five star and I'm really excited to read the rest of the series now. I haven't read any of the other books. so Okay, that was going to be my question because I think there's two others or three? There's four. It's a four book series, I should say. So there's three others. Um, Okay. And, and that's it, right? The series is completed. <laughs> uh, yeah, the series is all done. Um, I ordered really nice special edition copies, and they're coming in March. So I'm waiting wow. for those copies to come in before I finish the series. Okay. I thought you had read more of the other books. Okay, so this will be a good, like, I don't know, good discussion because we're all kind of yeah. in a similar place. Yes, yeah. I I don't know any spoilers or anything after Ooh. this. <laughs> yeah that's good but i'm also like oh, i have questions <laughs> that's okay <laughs> who's gonna answer my questions to read the rest of the series add it to my tbr <laughs> let's get into some like first impression discussions what did you guys think about like the characters is there one that you liked more than the others i don't know if i had a, a favorite i thought all of the characters were really engaging i was really there were a lot of people to keep track of mm-hmm. especially kind of young people and the narrative switched around quite a lot to like kind of focus in on some of them which i thought was really well done that could have been really confusing but i thought libba bray handled it really well um i should say as well that i've read uh, her other series the Gemma doyle books oh. starting with a uh, great and terrible beauty which are very different so i had read some libba bray books before this that I really enjoyed when I was younger. So I kind of thought it was going to be similar style, not really very different. But I still um, it was kind of good. I knew that Libba Bray was a a skilled writer. So sorry, back to your question about the characters. (laughs) Um, I found I really related the most to Mabel, Mm. which is maybe like kind of sad, because she doesn't really get a whole lot in this book. Um, She's like quiet and bookish and uh, like crushing on someone from afar, which is such an extremely relatable thing for me. Um, <laughs> that was probably who I connected to the most, but I also really loved Evie. I thought she was flawed and like selfish sometimes, but in ways that was always like kind of endearing and she kind of knew it and tried to make amends, which I, I don't know. I thought she was a great character. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know if I had a favorite character. I found there were certain chapters where I was a little disappointed to be straying away from Evie's perspective or like her Mm storyline. But I also think it's not really fair to I'm thinking of like the Memphis chapters, because it's not that Mm -hmm. I didn't enjoy them. But I think his connection to the like main plot came later. So at the beginning, I was like, oh, but I want to go back to the main problem, you know? But then when he started coming into the main plot, I was like, okay. And I didn't care that we went into his perspective. Um, I I don't know. Maybe my favorite would be either Evie or Sam. Just because Sam made me laugh a lot. I loved Sam. Yeah. (laughs) He had this, like, certain, like, (laughs) scuzzy charm that... I am so into, especially with like a period <laughs> yes. book like this. It gave me he, like he had, 
yeah he and had yes, the he had the lingo for yeah. that character yes. <laughs> and i think that he was perfectly executed yeah i wrote a note i think when i first like when we first meet sam being like why the hell do i love him so much oh god <laughs> like i was like oh no I guess I should clarify too. I, it's not that I didn't like him. It's that I liked him, but I didn't get enough of him in the book. Like I found he kind of faded to the background. Mm. And I, again, that's probably like, that's probably important later on. Like I'm sure maybe the next book focuses more on him or there's more setup going on. But I really felt like there was going to be more of him in the story. And he kept conveniently being like in a different place. So I was kind of like, oh, what? why, why is he here? Like, what's he doing here? What's the point then? I don't fully understand. But that's probably addressed later on. I will say I was a little surprised about how little Mabel was in the book because she's her she best was friend. too, yeah. Yeah. Yes. And she's not even mentioned in the uh, synopsis from the publisher. It's like Mabel doesn't matter, <laughs> which makes me so sad. But I mean, God. I understand, but I do feel bad for her. And I wonder... If she's going to be in the next book or even like any of the series, any of the books in the series, I don't know. Mm. Right. But I would like to learn more from her. And I I feel like she's it's just the beginning of her story. And I feel like she is going to have this like transformation or like come into her own and take charge of her own life. So it did feel like foreshadowing yeah. for that. I, yeah. I hope that for her. Yeah. 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 I wasn't like a huge Mabel fan. I think during the the first time I read the book, I was kind of like blasé about her. I didn't really think about her either way. But this time reading it, Evie chafed me the wrong way with mm -hmm. her mm -hmm. some of her decisions towards her friend. Yes, but totally. then Mabel is like so wishy-washy with everything that I found myself yep. getting annoyed and being like, can you just make a decision or just like be there or don't be there, but just like pick one and be happy with it because mm -hmm. i'm so tired of this like oh but like we're gonna get in trouble we are gonna get in trouble then go home i don't know like <laughs> <laughs> so i just i found yeah. that the second time around where i was able to just like focus a little bit more on all of those interactions because i wasn't so story driven and i was mm -hmm. just like oh, mabel like get out of here Go with your long <laughs> oh, no. hair somewhere else. <laughs> I Oh, dear. I have a feeling you wouldn't have liked me in high school. <laughs> <laughs> but I love you now, and that's what matters. <laughs> yeah, well, I, and I had my moment of coming into my own, and Mabel will too. So mm -hmm. that's what I, I, that's I hope what I she want. does. <laughs> <laughs> I also really, really liked Theta and Henry and their relationship. Oh, yeah, they had a great dynamic. Yes, mm -hmm. and I just thought, like, there were a lot of different characters in this book in general which is yes. nice to read they're not all the same personality they're not all the same uh they don't have all the same goals or backgrounds or whatever and it mm -hmm. makes total sense because it's set in new york you know where most of the people came into new york you know <laughs> not a lot of people mm -hmm. i think there's even a line about it in the book about most people who are from new york city aren't from new york city right yeah so yeah i really enjoyed them and i loved all the different characters coming together and how that played out what did you guys think about the atmosphere i know that i got messages from both of you being like this is really scary <laughs> and i was like why do i always pick books that like just show like visceral reactions for you guys like what is what is going on because when i i read it i was not like oh this is really scary i was like i'm spooked and i love it so <laughs> I was like, yeah, I'm going to read with find... a flashlight and, and wonder if if the bad guy's, like, right behind me. <laughs> <laughs> so that doesn't thrill me, but I'm glad it does for you. <laughs> I don't think I was, like, scared, scared, but I do recall sitting on the couch with my husband on the other couch and me going, like, oh, God, like, as I was reading it, and being like, oh, my God. But I kept reading, like, I was still okay, but I was like oh my god, this is a lot more intense for a YA book. This could easily be an adult book. I don't understand why, like, it could, I think it could still be an adult book, honestly. Like, I know there's, like, little, like, 
frivolous like teenage things but overall it's quite a serious book and intense like there's a lot mm-hmm. of serious discussions which i'm sure we'll talk about in the, l- the latter part of the episode but yeah i thought it was very well done very creepy eerie i loved how Libba bray personified the wind I highlighted a huge passage of that. I just loved oh, yeah. whenever she would go into like the wind crept over here or whatever, or like the fog did this. Like I just loved those parts. So mm-hmm. yeah, it was spooky, but I was okay. <laughs> yeah, the the intrigue in this book was very high for me. Mm-hmm. And it, I don't know, there's something about this that I was kind of worried the second time reading it if I wasn't going to like it as much because I already knew where the plot was going. And usually with books that have kind of like big reveals or follow um, some kind of like crime, I'm not really into it the second time because I'm like, oh, yeah, I already know. But Mm -hmm. this one still kept my attention. I listened to the audiobook, um, this read through, and the narrator was so amazing. You could tell distinctly who she was talking for. For every Mm. different perspective, she did all of these amazing voices and accents and intonations for everybody. And it was such a great experience to listen to it. Cool. Yeah, I feel like it would be a good, a good audiobook, because like you said, that there's so many different characters and so many different things happening and the like the 20s the hey come on down you know, <laughs> you know? and like all of that is would be very fun to listen to kind of like a like a radio play like mm-hmm. i could see that being the sort of vibe of the audiobook um i i read it on my kobo so that's that's how i that's how i chose to enjoy the book um <laughs> and i love the atmosphere i felt it really kind of like sucked me in i think i said this near the beginning too i really felt like i was in the 20s I guess what it comes down to is I don't I don't always read a lot of historical fiction. Same. Um, I enjoy historical fiction, but I don't always gravitate towards it in the same way that I do a lot of like fantasy or sci-fi or romance. Like those are kind of ones that I tend to go for more. Um, but I enjoy historical fiction, and I do find uh, this is a YA novel, but it also felt like really, like you said, Kelly, really well researched, really immersive in the time and place Mm -hmm. and so i really liked that about it as well yeah i don't read a lot of historical fiction uh i actually i think if i had to choose a genre that would be one of my least favorite genres and i think it's just because i would rather watch historical fiction than Mm -hmm. read it a lot of the times because i find more detail visually yes and also Mm -hmm. like i don't know why but i feel (laughs) with my limited experience reading the genre i feel like a lot of times when you read historical fiction it's more about like contemporary dramatic or melodramatic kind of things and like i'd rather see that than read it most of the time because it just gets like Mm. drawn out in slow pacing so whereas this was like mystery horror Mm -hmm. you know supernatural where i can get on board quicker because it's more fast paced and i'm intrigued to know what is happening and trying to guess things and whatever versus like I'm watching people do laundry all day and then they're talking about so-and-so ran off with so-and-so and and I'd rather watch that than read it. (laughs) So (laughs) yeah, I was really struck by how long it was though. I wasn't really expecting that when I first started. A lot of YA novels are usually like snip snap, Mm -hmm. but they're, you know, quick and and dirty. Well, not dirty. Um, (laughs) You you know what I mean? Like they get, they get in, they get out, they get it all done. Yes. And (laughs) This one, even though it was long, I did find it clipped along, which I Mm -hmm. liked. And I thought there was a reason for it being long. Like if I was thinking back on all the things that happened, there was a lot that happened. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot to introduce us to and a lot of ideas and reveals and like history and all that stuff. So it made sense that it was long and it was well, well paced, I thought. Mm -hmm. I agree. So Kelly and I had a hard time kind of picking what we wanted to do for book recommendations but tilly luckily is going to give all of our listeners two great book recommendations in case you liked (laughs) the diviners so tilly take it away i'm so excited to give two because i often come up with like more than one book recommendations but for time you know i have to like restrain myself (laughs) let it all out (laughs) i'm gonna let it all out 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 (laughs) She is a learned woman. (laughs) Yes. 
<laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I loved it. I think I've had too much coffee today, so that's my current problem. But anyway, okay. So uh, here are a couple of book recommendations I had. I thought of these books a lot while I was reading The Diviners, and uh, maybe you would like them as well if you like The Diviners. So the first one, I've mentioned it in another episode, uh, The Chosen and the Beautiful by Nevo. This is a recent read. It's a great Gatsby retelling set in the same time period as this book. It also has strange, dark magic and this like sparkly protagonist who drinks a lot of gin and has a lot of secrets and like gets into trouble a lot. Um <laughs> I would say that The Chosen and the Beautiful is much more of a literary novel than a plot-driven YA novel. So maybe if you liked the pacing of The Diviners, you wouldn't be as interested in this. But if what you liked about The Diviners was the time period, the lingo, the like vibes of the time, then maybe give that a try. Cool. Um, the second book recommendation I had was, okay, not really related in plot or content, but I thought had a lot of similarities in themes like mythology and the occult. Uh, and that is Dark Fever by Karen Marie Moaning. Oh. Um, this one is an adult book. It features a protagonist also grieving the loss of a sibling thrust into a new environment with all this like magic and artifacts that she doesn't really understand. Um, and this one is more grounded in like Irish seely and unseely fairy lore. Mm. Um, so I actually read it because I thought it was going to be like a fun romance and it was certainly not either fun or a romance. <gasps> it was oh, no. very dark, very gritty, very compelling, ridiculous lingo from the character it was like very early 2000s she's kind of like a paris hilton kind of character oh, okay. um and then there's all these crazy things happening in the plot that's like really really fun to read so i enjoyed that a lot and thought about it while i was reading this book strangely so maybe you would enjoy it too <laughs> no romance oh, awesome. at all <laughs> no i know i was really shook i think in the like second or th not in the second one because i read the second one too still nothing uh like some like sexy moments happened mm -hmm. but not like in a way that i would have wanted mm. Interesting. um okay. i think maybe in the third book it gets like steamy but that's kind of what i thought the whole <laughs> anyway i was misled it's fine i really enjoyed what i read anyway so <laughs> that's awesome so we're going to move into spoilers territory now. If you haven't read the book and don't want to know how it all turns out, maybe you should stop listening now. And if you like what you're hearing, feel free to leave us a rating or review on your podcast app of choice. Are we ready, everybody? Yeah! To begin with a quick recap of the whole book so we're all on the same page. All right. This book takes place in 1920s New York in the height of prohibition and fascination with the occult. The first chapter focuses on a young flapper's party where the tipsy guests play with a Ouija board, which releases the ominous spirit Naughty John into the world. We then follow Evie O'Neill, a teenage party girl in Ohio rebelling after the death of her older brother James in World War I. Evie often gets in trouble for her mysterious ability. She can feel others' emotions and memories when holding an object. When she reveals a scandalizing secret about a cocky playboy at a party, her family sends her to New York to live with her uncle, Will Fitzgerald. For Evie, moving to the big city is anything but a punishment. Even if her uncle is distant and owns the peculiar museum of American folklore, superstition, and the occult. Upon her arrival to the city, Evie is pickpocketed by a flirtatious young man named Sam Lloyd, who steals a kiss as well as her money. Evie is furious, but he disappears before she can do anything about it. Evie meets up with her childhood friend Mabel, who lives in the same building as her uncle Will. Mabel is quiet and bookish, the daughter of communist organizers, and has had a crush on museum assistant Jericho Jones for years. Evie also befriends a glamorous young Ziegfeld dancer named Theta Knight, who lives in the building with a young man named Henry, and they both seem to have secrets of their own. The narrative switches to introduce us to Memphis Campbell, a handsome young poet working as a numbers runner in Harlem. He and his little brother Isaiah have been living with their aunt after their mother's death. Memphis used to be able to heal people, but the gift left him when he tried to save his dying mother. He keeps dreaming about a mysterious symbol and is drawn to an old abandoned house on a hill. His little brother Isaiah can sometimes tell the future, and Memphis takes him to a card reader named Margaret Walker for lessons. After a gruesome murder with mysterious symbols on the victim, Uncle Will is called in to help with the investigation. Evie and Jericho tag along, and when Evie touches the victim's shoe, she sees horrifying flashes of the girl's death. Back at the museum, Evie reads about the diviners. 
gifted people who can see the dead, speak with spirits, talk in dreams, and read meaning from objects. As the story goes on and more murders are committed, we learn more about Naughty John Hobbs and his connection to a sinister cult called the Brethren, as well as the history of the old house on the hill, which once belonged to heiress Ida Knowles, but became Naughty John's murderous lair. Theta and Memphis meet at a speakeasy and discover they both share nightmares, forming an instant connection. Evie makes a spontaneous deal with a reporter, feeding him information on the murders so he will give the museum and Evie some publicity. Will and Evie find an old ritual to raise an entity called the Beast, which coincides with a comet passing. The steps of the ritual match the murders so far, and the comet is due to pass in a few weeks on my birthday, October 8th. I noticed that. <laughs> As the investigation grows more intense, Evie and Jericho grow closer, despite Evie's knowledge of Mabel's crush. After a narrow escape from religious fanatics, Jericho is injured, and Evie learns that he has machinery in his body, as he was experimented upon after childhood paralysis, and now needs a mysterious serum to remain healthy. Everything comes to a head the night of the comet's passing, when naughty John Hobbs plans to return as the Beast and start the apocalypse. Uncle Will and Sam are arrested for the murders due to planted evidence. Evie and Jericho go to the house on the hill to destroy whatever is holding the spirit there. Naughty John shows up and plans to kill Evie as his final sacrifice, but she manages to bind him and his spirit minions into her pendant, the last thing her brother gave her before he went to war. She and Jericho escape as the house burns to the ground. We see scenes from each of the Diviner characters setting the scene for the next book, including an ominous appearance from a gray man in a stovepipe hat who speaks to the dead. Uncle Will looks through a secret file that names him and Margaret Walker as former government agents of the supernatural. Will threatens to send Evie back home, so she tells the press about her ability. Evie has uneasy dreams about her brother. At the very end, Jericho tells Evie how he feels about her, and they kiss. <laughs> Love a good I forgot that it ended with a kiss. I, I feel like yeah. the thing that I remembered it ending with was her badass like binding into this pendant what? and all of that like excitement at the house. And then as I was writing up this little uh, summary, I was thinking, trying to remember what happened. And then I was like, oh, I guess that is how it ended. I look back at the last couple pages. <laughs> yeah, I did find the ending was quite drawn out. Like I was reading on my Kobo and listening to it and I was like, wait a sec, we still have like 50 pages. Like what? Like they've already killed the baddie, you know? <laughs> and obviously- See, I, I really like that in books. I, It's a huge pet peeve of mine when the action just finishes and two pages later, they're like, great, we're done. And I'm like, but yeah, what sure. the I, fuck happens to everybody else? Yeah. I want to know. The <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want it to end two pages after, but I did. I was kind of like, what could possibly happen next? <laughs> you know? <laughs> what have they got to talk about? <laughs> but it's all good. I was just like, whoa, what? <laughs> I do wonder, do too, oh, if God. if this book series reads more as, like, one book. I think probably you're right. Because there is so much and there are so many characters and so many things that were being set up in this one. If it is better to just read it continuously through the, all four um cuz then you're not really feeling that extra bit at the end because you're going right in with the plot to the to the second one. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. But it didn't bother me. <laughs> How did we feel about Evie and Jericho kissing at the end? <sighs> I was annoyed. I was mad. Yeah. I was you mad. Were mad. I was like, yes. Why? I was just okay. Because I was identifying with Mabel, right. I was mad that Evie hadn't even talked to her about like how she might have feelings for Jericho. Mm. Because I really feel that that should have been a conversation. I understand that Mabel and her kind of like drifted apart a bit near the end. That they had that fight after they got arrested. And I, I did kind of see that there was like, you know, Evie was working more closely with Jericho and things were just like, oh, I don't know that it just happened. Like it just these feelings developed. But I really wanted there to be a conversation, at least. I did like that um, the author made kind of a point to have a 
an interaction with Mabel and another promising young man, Mm -hmm. young suitor, perhaps. (laughs) And I think I did notice that Libba Bray also wrote in a section about Mabel where she kind of expressed that it maybe wasn't so much that she was in love with Jericho as with the idea of him Mm -hmm. and the idea of being like liked by someone like him. So Mm -hmm. I I did feel a bit better after reading that. And I thought, okay, so, you know, obviously Mabel's like, she's going to be fine. But I really wanted there to be a conversation, at least, because it all felt kind of sneaky. And Mm. I thought, Evie, come on, (laughs) talk to your friend. She's such a good friend. (laughs) Right. I I see that. And then at the same time, I feel like, you know how trauma bonding is a thing (laughs) and um they went through so much together and i feel like the end of the book isn't all that long after all of this stuff happens when you're wrapped up in those feelings and that person was with you when you almost died and blah 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 Mm -hmm. blah blah. i i do feel like evie and jericho are going to end up being together through the books that's kind of my um but I also am like, is he going to go crazy and like kill somebody? Like I kind of right, is it going to like Hulk out or like um, <laughs> yeah. the monkey guy in X Men? Uh, like sometimes he was like cool and nice and sweet, and then I felt like he had an edge to him that I wasn't sure if he was going to turn into a villain or something. Mm. Right. So I I feel like there's a good chance that they can stay together. I do think that there's going to be some stuff with Sam. I hope mm-hmm. there is. I think that. It was set up really well that Sam would be the obvious choice Mm -hmm. as, like, this enemies to lovers for Evie to go with because he is a lot more, like, in her world of, like, you know, going out and partying at a speakeasy, the lingo, the drinking, the, the, like, worldliness, I guess. But I don't know. I didn't hate that they kissed i liked it and i think i was so fed up with mabel that i was like i don't care <laughs> oh my gosh Aww. okay so Poor mabel i was mad because okay when i look at all the clues in the book i'm like should she end up with sam mm, probably not but i i like sam more than i like jericho and i think it's because i just didn't get enough of jericho until like the last bit of the book like when he starts mm-hmm, to open up quiet. a bit. Yeah. And I just am kind of like, no, I don't want you to be of Jericho. My God. <laughs> like, why? I got so You were so mad. invested, though. Yes. Because I just think, okay, typical, like, brooding Hamlet kind of character. Like, oh, I'm different. <laughs> No one I understands need to, me. Like, yeah, I'm a monster. And then he's like, you also have some weird stuff in your past. We're perfect for each other. I'm like, bitch, <laughs> you've already been like, oh, she was talking to Sam this whole time and they did connect. Okay. The reason why I was like, maybe she shouldn't end up with Sam either is because like, you can't just keep being aggressively flirtatious, you know, but I know. there was a connection. They did open up to each other about like their past and they also connect with their abilities you know she doesn't know Mm -hmm. everything yet but i just was kind of like no as soon as as soon as i read the sentence where jericho or evie caught jericho looking at her before she revealed um that she could like get info from objects i was like no i could see it coming and i was like no i don't want this so that's how i felt (laughs) no feelings at all (laughs) No, zero feelings, as usual. (laughs) I just really wish that Evie had, like, thought about Mabel more near the end. I feel like Mabel was also not that good of a friend, though. Because every time Evie wanted to do something, Mabel would be, like, so salty about it and be like, well, no, that's not a good idea. You shouldn't do that. Like, but then she'd tag along, like Mm -hmm. I said earlier, like, piss or get off the pot. Like, be there and have fun or go home. Mm -hmm. So... I feel like she also, like, they they did this to each other on different spectrums. Like, Evie was on one mm-hmm. end being like, come on, pie face, which is the worst nickname ever and is yeah, not endearing at all. <laughs> right? no. Come on, pie face, let's go and do this thing that's, like, really bad. And then Mabel, on the other hand, going and doing it, but then being, like, upset about it the whole time and, yeah. like, pulling that down. I really felt... For Evie when Mabel's like I'm not having fun here we have to go oh, and yeah, Evie's like weird. well I'm having fun so why don't you go by yeah. yourself and I feel like I've been in that situation 
so many times with people. And I'm like, why do I always have to be the one to ruin my night? Because somebody else isn't having a good time. Mm. I understand sometimes, like, you know, take one for the team and go. But I have mm. been that person enough that I'm like, I was really on Evie's side there of being like, yeah. no, I'm having fun. I want to meet people and dance and drink my gin that could potentially make me go blind and that, that's what i want to do and it's not like anything serious happened to mabel i think like if something serious went right? down evie would probably hopefully leave i don't know if she would honestly but you know like i think she would i hope so i hope so <laughs> i mean she did some other pretty serious stuff during the book yes so. yes but yeah, I don't really, think that Mabel was really a good friend either. I think you're probably right. And I think maybe what this is all coming down to is we, we're forgetting, I think, that Mabel and Evie had been apart for a long time mm -hmm. and had been like childhood friends and then are trying to like keep that friendship. And maybe they're they're not good at communicating, obviously. And maybe they're trying to like push this friendship that like they're not putting enough work into do you know what i mean yes, yeah I and i know that that's what all of us are picking up on <laughs> they talk in the book about how mabel has kept writing to evie all the time and yep. evie doesn't answer that often <gasps> and when she does it's like just a few lines and like yeah i hope you're doing well like yeah. some I mean, not all friendships are built to last, and especially when you grow into such opposite sides of the spectrum in completely different states, I yeah. think it's really hard to find something to, like, commonly relate to, mm -hmm. and the only thing that holds them together through this book is the fact that Evie loves to, like, get into some shit and wants to help Mabel get Jericho. Mm -hmm. I think right. that's like the only thing that like holds them together because that's what they do every time they're together is they just talk about Jericho and what he's doing and maybe if Mabel looks a little more like fashionable Jericho will like her and whatever whatever mm -hmm. which like been there I've had those conversations when I was a teenager you know <laughs> I've I've talked ad nauseum about whatever person I was into at the time and how I could like get their attention mm -hmm. so that felt very real yes yeah. but I it, it did feel like looking as an adult at those conversations I was yeah. like come on guys there's more going on here literally in this story and also with both of you yeah, yeah. let's move away from yeah, Mabel we talked about them a and lot. Wow, because we a lot Mabel <laughs> Mabel might not even be in the rest of these books. So yeah. like let's just <laughs> from that what did you guys think about Naughty John like the the actual like overarching like plot <sighs> antagonist for this book cuz I was obsessed. Yeah. And the song gives me nightmares <laughs> and yeah, I thought it was did so they sing good. The song on the audiobook? Yes, they do. She sings a song. I listened oh, to it at two times that. speed and then like slightly faster near the end. And it was like, <laughs> like the vibrato. I was like, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she so does fast. like a really two good like speed. 1920s <laughs> vibrato in it. But it's just like the basic kind of like melody. You would think yeah. of like, Naughty John, Naughty John does his work with his apron on. Yeah. Like that's basically how she sings that. it. Yeah, <laughs> that's too creepy. It is creepy. I did find it interesting that we already know who the villain is, sort of, mm -hmm. like at the beginning. At the very beginning. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Because they like we don't we don't know who the flapper is at the party, I don't think. I don't think we ever find out, do we? No. No, yeah. I think it's just some rando. Yeah. But like they summon him from the Ouija board and then they don't say goodbye. Mistake number one. Okay? They did not finish what they started. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't say goodbye to him. They let him stay out in the material world and i had to go cut the rug okay like, <laughs> yeah material world. i know i was like material girls <laughs> but so i did find it very interesting that we knew from the beginning like oh naughty john they they contacted him and he didn't get put back like it wasn't like explicitly spelled out but like it kind of was in a way, but it wasn't. And it didn't affect my enjoyment at all. I was just like, ooh, where's he going now? Where's the wind blowing? Like, I was really into it. I thought he was terrifying. I was very interested to learn more about him and, like, 
why. So I loved the parts with um, Evie talking to Mary and um, like going into his past with the, uh, was it the ring? Yeah, with the ring. So mm-hmm. I really liked him. I thought he was creepy AF. I thought what he did to the bodies was so disgusting. Yeah. I thought it was very effective. Yeah, listeners, what did he do? <laughs> well, what didn't he do? One person, he took their mouth out and hung him up like Jesus on the cross to Gabe, to Memphis's BFF Gabe. Oh, that was very upsetting. That was yeah. really gross. He took someone's hands. He took someone's skin. Like yeah, all of the a lot skin. Of gross, gruesome. Yeah. <sighs> so, yeah. That's why I'm like, why yeah, I, I know. It was pretty gritty. I didn't feel that the descriptions were gruesome. I was like, okay, facts. My jaw he took is their hands. Listeners. <laughs> Great. <laughs> facts. <laughs> I don't know. I wasn't like really grossed out by it. I was you like, high okay. Threshold, though. <laughs> I am never gonna piss off Mickey. Okay, no. <laughs> I'm just kidding, Mickey. But I, I pass out won't. when I see blood in real life. So, <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> I have you a really, multitudes. I have a really high uh, vasovagal response to <laughs> any kind of open skin thing. Oh no, <laughs> interesting. But yeah, well, I don't know. I wasn't affected by it. I was like, this is really cool. Like. Not really cool that he did it, but a really good setup Mm -hmm. for Mm -hmm. all of the rest of the book. Yeah. I think if these people were just like, oh, yeah, there's a pentagram on them, I'd be like, hey, that's kind of lame. Like, you've been there, done that. (laughs) Pentagram on a murdered body, every second psycho's doing that and his brother. But, like, (laughs) the actually, like, what he did to them and, like, seeing because you read chapters of him luring these people in Mm -hmm. to get to the point where they're being found uh, mutilated, essentially makes it so much more interesting and intriguing than, oh, we got a call. There's a weird weird body down by the docks or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I really liked that. And the scene in the pig factory is that what it is that was my favorite that was so scary in terms of like bringing the story together more Mm -hmm. that it it i don't know above and beyond the description in that and the like the sleaziness of it was all there it was great Mm. yeah i really do feel um i hadn't really considered it kelly until you brought it up that we know who Naughty John is at the beginning, or we know that there's a spirit named Naughty John. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I guess what becomes interesting going forward is that you learn the why. So you know who the who is, but you don't know the why. And that's what keeps you, keeps you guessing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or the how, or like the, yeah, like what, from what, (laughs) from whence it came. Um, Yeah. I really feel that the, the villain is good because it's so plausible. Mm -hmm. It's so plausible that there are like, crazies out there who have these ideas about summoning rituals and starting up uh like you know the apocalypse with the antichrist Mm -hmm. and that and and because she pushes it even further into the realm of like no actually paranormal though like with the spirits and with and with like you know he transforms into a beast at the end and like there's you know just all sorts of craziness happening and I think that's what made it really spooky for me and, and scary is that there is that element of reality mm-hmm. of like, yep, psychopaths do, yeah. do, are into this sort of thing. Yeah. And they do keep it very realistic in terms of what the characters think is going on until yeah. right. pretty close to the end of the book. They're really set on um, that a member of the Brethren is just doing these crimes because mm-hmm. he thinks that it's right. going to complete this ritual or whatever like a real person is out there psychotically killing people Mm -hmm. instead of the the uh, essence of john hobbs which also i just thought was like such a simple name but such a great name for a killer and like john mm -hmm. hobbs that sounds like 
it's a historical yeah. figure already, but like from before, because I remember learning about John Hobbes in high school, but he was like a philosopher or something. Like I learned about him in civics yeah, class. Yeah, different John Hobbes. Yeah, because yeah. I was like, John Hobbes? And I was like, oh my God, is that him? Like, <laughs> Still kind of bad, but yes. uh, not on the same level. <laughs> but I agree with you, Nikki. I think if they didn't have the chapters that followed the next victim right before they were murdered... I don't I think it still would have been effective but not as effective because the thing that really worked for me with this villain was that he was actually scary, you know, and like mm -hmm. there were real consequences. Like when Gabe, when Isaiah told Gabe like don't go under the bridge, you're going to die and he didn't listen, I knew right away, oh no, like he's going to die. It wasn't like, yeah. oh no, it's okay. He's going to be safe because he's a friend of a main character. No, 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 no. We know what's going to happen. Right. So there were stakes yes. and they, they, they were, they were met. Yes. Well, even when Isaiah tells Mary Walker to watch out for the chair yeah. and she, she knows about his gift. And even then sh he leaves and she immediately gets up <laughs> on the chair to go get something from the cupboard or whatever and the chair breaks. Mm -hmm. She doesn't get hurt. But books like this and reading a lot of fiction and nonfiction that surround like the occult and like paranormal activity is the reason I'm I feel like I'm quite superstitious. Mm -hmm. Or like maybe not superstitious, but like I'm a little stitious. Yes. <laughs> um, in <laughs> my you. real life about <laughs> if there is some kind of warning. Because I think it's better to just listen to it and maybe look a little silly later Same. than die. Same. I don't know. Like, it just seems like what a rational person would do. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I've told my husband on several accounts, like, I don't care if you think I'm out of my mind. If I'm like, there's something wrong with this house, we're moving. I've seen the movies, Paranormal Activity, one, two, three, four, however many there are. It's almost always the woman's like, I think something's wrong. And the man's like, huh, I don't believe you. Ooh, spirit, come and get me. And then they all die. So I'm like, don't you dare. If I sound stupid, just go, yes, dear, we're moving now. Don't you dare tell me I'm out of my mind. Like, let's just go. Because I'd rather look stupid later, but be alive, just like you said. So, right? Can I get uh, an amen up in here? I have not watched enough <laughs> ghost stories or uh, scary movies to have developed this level of feeling about Neither it. Neither have I. I really respect Please. both of you. I'm just so <laughs> oh. scared. <laughs> yeah. I'm always so you have no foundation, just fear. No, yes, because I will go like, oh, I don't really think there's like mean spirits, but just in case, I like look up and I'm like, it's all good. We're good. You know, like. <laughs> oh man, I gotta cover my bases. What did you guys think about? Okay, Blind Bill Johnson. So this is a oh. character that comes up. Um, in kind of innocuous ways, yes. kind of interacting with Memphis and Harlem as like this older blind man who, you know, talks to Memphis. I think he like plays some of the numbers, um, which is some sort of like lottery situation that's happening there. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and then later on, we kind of get these like inklings that Bill Johnson is not who he purports to be yeah. and he's maybe got some sort of abilities and then he like tries to hurt isaiah and maybe like steal his gift to get his eyesight back and then i thought all of a sudden he's evil mm -hmm. so that's how i feel about it what's going on with both of you so the history with him is like everybody has all of these different ideas of how he lost his eyesight or whatever mm -hmm. and he hears from isaiah when he's talking to him that isaiah can predict the cards yep. at Mary Walker's house. And he goes, great. I'm going to get him to predict the numbers so that I can get money. So he like right. sucks this information from him, kind of like sucking the life out of him. Right. And I, him. yes. Yeah. I think that if he would have kept doing it, he would have died potentially, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but he gets stopped just in the right amount of time, I think, by Memphis. Mm -hmm. And then Memphis suddenly heals heals Isaiah. Yeah. But I'd, I had a lot of really complicated thoughts about Bill. Same. Mm -hmm. I don't think he's inherently bad. Well, I guess no one's like inherently bad or inherently good or whatever. <laughs> but I think that when you're in a desperate situation, you will do desperate things. Totally. 
to get by. I think also because he can't see, that also adds another layer of like uh, anonymity to what he's doing. And Mm -hmm. like, I don't really know what this kid looks like. I don't really know anything about him. So I'm going to do this thing because there's already another level of like being removed from it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's like fact, but that's just how it felt. Mm -hmm. Like he Mm -hmm. felt bad about it, but he was also like, exactly. He felt bad, but not that bad. Yeah. And he also at one point brings up that like there he hears a pause in conversation between octavia and memphis i think and he's like okay i'm assuming they nodded to each other and then he was like i wonder how many silent conversations i've missed over the years you know so it's like he's like having a moment of feeling bad for himself but also kind of angry you know it's like there's like this (laughs) secret world that i'm not a part of for me bill really upset me because i was like i felt like that tyra banks meme I was rooting for you. We were all rooting for you. Like, I was really endeared yeah. by him. I thought he was, like, a really nice neighborhood friend. You know, like, just this, you know, pleasant older man you talk to every day. And when we saw the nastier side come out, I was like, oh, no. Like, I felt so disappointed, let down, and angered by him. But, like, mm-hmm. I thought it was very well done. And I want to know what happens next what kind of role he's going to play because I definitely don't think he's done. And I wonder what he's going to do if he's going to like turn out to be like against the diviners or if he's going to join up with them and help them in whatever the overall goal is with the diviners. I don't know, but yeah, I really went through the ups and downs with him. I was like, Oh my gosh, I know. And I didn't expect it. I know, me neither. It really felt like a like a super villain origin story. Yes. Mm-hmm. Like that was kind of what I what I got from him. And I think he mentioned too that he wasn't really as old as he appeared to be because he had had the life kind of like sucked out of him mm. by government agents. I think from like that Project Buffalo, right? Mm. That keeps coming up now and again. Right. I don't know. I don't remember him mentioning Project Buffalo, but I do know that I was like really happy at the end when Will pulls out the folder that says Project mm-hmm. Buffalo. Oh, yeah. Drama. <laughs> I was like, yes, we're getting more. Maybe the lady he was in love with is Sam's mom. <gasps> and like, I ha- just have all of these theories uh, because Sam never sees the picture. And I'm just like, what is going on here? I need to know more. I love, I feel like this book has everything that I have ever wanted. Mm -hmm. It has secret society things, like underground government work, occults, murders, magical powers, ghosts, some romance, like what else could I ask for? (laughs) It has some kitschy kitschy lines. (laughs) Oh my God. I have to... I have to read some of this lingo because it's <laughs> killing me. My favorite part of it, so many funny, funny words that are just like so <laughs> silly to think about in, in this time, a hundred years later, and then made me think about what are people going to be laughing about that we say a hundred years from now? Oh. I don't know. Um, so this is my favorite section. I think it's when Henry and Evie and Theta are all having drinks together and just like having a good time partying it up. And Evie giggled. I like you, Henry. I like you too, evil, because they call her evil, which is very funny. And Evie says, are we palski? And he says, you bet ski. Theta crashed next to them on the thick zebra skin rug. I'm embalmed, <laughs> potted and splificated, ossified to the gills. Time for night night. Whatever you say, baby vamp. <laughs> and I was like, I read that whole section. Then I read it again. I'm like, what are they talking about? Being drunk. Okay. Love it. <laughs> I couldn't figure out what do they mean when they're like, give them the bums rush. Like, you mean kick them out? But I'm like, bums rush. Yeah, I didn't no. think it was this kind of book. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, I think it's kicking out kicking out bums rushing them out of the rushing them out of the anyway I will I have to say um, it's very rare in a book that's set in the past that I actually recognize songs and I felt so like hey, hey, because I love jazz standards and when she was like um, we'll take Manhattan da, 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 and Coney Island or Staten Island too you know I've heard Ella Fitzgerald sing that so many times. I was like, oh my God, I actually know this one. I can hear it in my head. It's so great. 
feel like not to mention the fact that you were listening to the audiobook so you could no. actually hear it in your head but not for the whole time <laughs> i didn't listen to it the whole time this was before whatever okay. nikki <laughs> <laughs> sorry no <laughs> oh my god mom dad don't fight <laughs> have either of you been into a speakeasy before i think there's one in halifax yeah i went into the one i don't remember the name but i went into one in halifax that was like underneath a dessert slash breakfast fancy place and i didn't know i was going okay so little me you know how i dress i keep it pretty uh casual and i was traveling too like i was not i don't know so i was wearing sweatpants and like or yoga pants t-shirts sports bra had my ponytail and I'm like, what? Where are we going? We go through the back of the kitchen downstairs. And then we're in this swanky ass speakeasy, like fully outfitted. We're in the 30s and 20s. And they've got even like jazz music playing. Everything was so pretty. And I was like, God damn it. Like, why am I here in my yoga pants? Like, ugh. but it was fun. That's I had, funny. I think I had a drink called Camp David and it was like very good, but <laughs> yum. Like I said earlier about just how researched this was and like how how intricate everything played out or how woven together everything was with the way Libba Bray wrote it, I felt at times that I didn't know what was real and what wasn't because, I mean, mm. this shouldn't come as a surprise to people, but I was not alive in the 20s, so <laughs> I don't know. What? <laughs> yeah. So I did find that super super interesting and i like highlighted a bunch of things on my kobo that i want to look up later because she didn't she did talk about some things in the author's note but not everything but like i want to know but i gotta be careful what i google because i don't want that in my life <laughs> i need to google this brethren <laughs> <laughs> figure out what's going on because i know that they were real um like the church that they were a part of or formed was real um and on that sub sort of on that subject like will the uncle who's supposed to be like the researcher here and running the museum. I didn't really care for him. I kind of got annoyed at him a lot of the time because he was like the stereotypical adult figure who was like, oh, I'll tell you later. You won't understand now. Or like, don't do this, but I won't tell you why. Like, are you joking? And I think Evie at one point <laughs> says something along the lines of that too, because she's like, I solved this crime. I took him down. Like, what is what is your deal? You know, but I don't know. I kind of liked Uncle Will. I did too. I think I was I was picturing him <laughs> as like um in Stargate SG1, there's a character who's like a, a linguist and archaeologist named Daniel Jackson. And that's what I was picturing. He has like, you know, floppy hair and like glasses, but is like secretly buff and like kind of hot. So that, yes. maybe I'm like projecting, but that's hey. what I had in my head with Uncle Will. And he had a lot of really good lines where he kind of like reminded Evie that the world isn't all entirely about her, which I think she needed reminding of mm -hmm. a lot of the time. Yeah. So I I liked him. I did think he was like distracted. I would have maybe liked to see like maybe I want a, a spin off series is all about Uncle Will as a kid. Oh like not a kid, but like when he was younger. Like Indiana and like Jones. during Project Buffalo. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I need like an That's yeah, what I want. I need an Indiana Jones adventure type story with Will. Yes. Then I'll be like, I'm on board. <laughs> But, like, not stealing artifacts, just um, discovering and asking politely if he can showcase them um, on a rotating basis. <laughs> I mean, he's definitely not a good businessman, so, like, he had to have done something before. I know. I'm kind of like, what is the music? Like, is it just a front for something? Like, is he really interested in running it as a museum? Is it just to, like, lay low for a while? But, like, if that were the case, wouldn't he do something less forward-facing? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I think that he, he seems to be really conflicted about he has the museum because that's how he is supposedly to make money but he right. doesn't feel right about monetizing these objects that are mm -hmm. so like spiritually valuable mm -hmm. and i i felt like he was a really good uncle figure right his niece has come to visit him in the summer with her parents and now all of a sudden he's her parental figure and he's like, I have this other kid, but he's not my kid really. He's just, he's always, he, Jericho seems like he's always been kind of older mm. 
and kind of always a little bit more mature. And he's dealing with Evie and he's kind of just in his like, head. Out of his like, depth. <laughs> yeah. And shaking his head in the corner all the time being like, what am I going to do with this girl? Mm. And I felt like that that worked a lot with the story because I think if he would have been less like that, all of the scenes of Evie going out wouldn't have really made sense because it just wouldn't have been able to happen realistically. I think that Will had to be like that for the plot to progress the way it did. Yeah. There was a really great section um, where, like, Evie was, you know, giving guides to, uh, or, like, guiding a group of people who came to visit the museum. And, yeah. of course, she's, like, making up all these extra things about the artifacts and making it sound more exciting. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the, the chapter or the paragraph ends with, like, Uncle Will uh, stubbed out his cigarette and then immediately lit another. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which I thought was so funny. He's like way out of his depth. Can't handle this person. <laughs> yeah. She's like, oh, I made the I made the little pendants out of tinfoil and wax. And he's like, no, and we're selling them not in the gift do shop. That. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I guess like I think I would have liked him as a character more if he had been a bit more. I don't want to say vulnerable, but like if he had been a bit more eccentric, you know what I mean? Like he just seemed very mm. cold to me, but I think that's just like of the time period and like the role that he is in. Right. So it's not even like it's wrong and I don't think it was done poorly, but I think for me to have liked him more, I would have wanted to see like little glimpses. The kooky uncle. Yeah. Or just mm. little glimpses yeah. because he has a very different um, life and lifestyle, right? But mm -hmm. he yeah. really he really felt to me like he was dealing with some shit, like he'd seen some shit that he hadn't gotten through. Yeah. And I hope that'll be kind of explored later, because I agree. I think he wasn't he was like distant and kind of cold. But there was this like spark within him that I hope we get to see more of or that we get to learn more about his kind of time in Project Buffalo and figure out why he is the way he is now because yeah I do get a sense that he is different now than he was as a younger man due to something that like made him this way right. and, and that intrigued me but I can totally understand why it was like mm -hmm. not as intriguing mm -hmm. to you. I have high hopes that he will become a much larger part yeah in later books because i think well it seems like he's going to be the one that kind of brings them all together he's like and Nick kind Fury. of X. becomes yeah. like the oh. leader of these these teenagers mm -hmm. branching off of that mm -hmm. the diviners mm -hmm. themselves seem to be a lot bigger in numbers than you initially anticipate at the beginning of the book totally. yes. they're all over the place <laughs> So what do you guys think? I I have a feeling it's like a lot of people are going around doing this or everybody has the ability, but only some people are tapped into it enough, whether it's from mm. uh, something that happened in their childhood or in their life to awaken this or they're born with like a higher sense of being than mm. other people, but they're all over the place. So, or is it just a coincidence that all of these people just seem to kind of like migrate to one another? I don't think it's a coincidence. I think they're drawn together um, mm -hmm. by the powers that be, you know? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm also, I don't know. I feel like, I know I've read somewhere before that like some people think that um, in terms of like psychic ability or intuition or whatever you want to call it, some people think that like, like you were saying, Nikki, that everyone is capable, but only some people are able to tap into or like allow themselves to channel it or whatever. But I don't know. I think I think maybe it's possible that anyone could be a diviner in this world, but I don't think that that is so, if that makes sense. Like, mm -hmm. I think it's like select few, either they've awakened it themselves or like maybe it's just like like you were saying stronger like i don't think it's everyone but i guess i argued for both ways i don't know <laughs> <laughs> well and and i think there were lots of hints near the end especially that even though naughty john is gone there's still the threat of this like mysterious gray man in the mm -hmm. stovepipe hat mm -hmm. and he's the one i think that memphis keeps dreaming about and theta. Mm -hmm. i think theta also dreams about him yeah. and so and I, and I think there's been there were some like hints as well that 
people saying, you know, something is happening, like it's coming back. Mm-hmm. I think the, oh yeah, the two older ladies who live in Uncle Will's apartment <gasps> building Lily too Addie, seem to be kind of, yeah, they seem to be kind of plugged into what's going on. Yeah. The Proctor sisters, which I was like, <gasps> okay, <Witchcraft>. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and they do feel kind of witchy and kind of like they know what's going on and what's approaching. And they've been talking about it like it's a storm that's Mm -hmm. coming in. Mm -hmm. So maybe, you know, these people are being born with these abilities and more of them are being born around this time. Well, I have a quote that might help explain some of this or like maybe we'll have a deeper understanding. I don't know. But this Mm -hmm. is, um, it's like in the latter half of the book. But uh, Will is explaining how spirit energy works, and he says, Spirits are attracted to seismic energy shifts, chaos and political upheaval, religious movements, war and invention, industry and innovation. There were said to be a great many ghost sightings and unexplained phenomena reported during the American Revolution, and again during the Civil War. This country is founded on a certain tension. There is a dualism inherent in democracy, opposing forces pushing against each other, always, Culture clashes, different belief systems, all coming together to create this country. But this balance takes a great deal of energy. And, as I've said, spirits are attracted to energy. So maybe there's more diviners being born Mm. because of these, like, seismic shifts. Or maybe more people are being awakened now because of the seismic shifts. I don't know. Well, and Mm -hmm. it's so soon after the First World War, too, Mm -hmm. which is, like, absolutely a seismic shift. And that, yeah, that, that makes sense to me. I hadn't really remembered or that part hadn't sunk into me. So that's really interesting to hear that again. Mm-hmm. I really liked that part. <laughs> but also, um, I need to ask because I don't know what to believe. Do you think John Hobbs was just planting a red herring about her brother James? Or do you think... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Do you think James is like something's going on with him? Because didn't Will say... Or no, John, I think, said that like... Just because you're talking to, maybe it was Will, he said something about like talking to dead people and that it's not always a good thing, even though like they were a good presence in your life, they might not always like be like have a a peaceful purpose or whatever, like they're haunting you. (laughs) So Mm. I don't know. What do you think? I don't know either. I I mean, when you're reading it, it sounds like quite obviously like a red herring. He's like trying to get her not to finish what she's mm-hmm. saying on time. So he's like bringing up her brother and, oh, well, your brother has like something to say to you. And she's like, what about my brother? <laughs> so it, it does like in the timing inherently feel like a red herring. Mm. I think that I would like for it not to be, though, because I think it would be really compelling. Yes. Yeah, I, I agree that at the in the time where, you know, she's trying to bind Naughty John into the pendant, he's like trying to distract her and saying, I was like, I don't believe that. He's just got a he's got an agenda. But then at the end, mm-hmm. when Evie dreams about James, which she's been dreaming about him this whole time, and then he speaks to her mm-hmm. and he says, I think they never should have done it. Which made me think, like, wait, maybe he was part of, like, the experimentation Mm -hmm. with um, Jericho, because Jericho talked about being in in the hospital beds with soldiers Mm -hmm. who had been, like, blown up in the war. So then I thought, oh, my God, maybe... Maybe James is part of that too. And oh my God, what if all this is happening? And it really sent me like into a spiral. So I I think that there's more to that yeah. and that we will find out more later. Yeah. Oh my God. It's like so good. We're also like, oh my God. <laughs> I know I'm stressed. <laughs> I know it made me think of a lot of like real life things throughout mm-hmm. this book, especially Will talking to Evie about the sisters that would read fortunes and then they took everything back and they were like, no, we didn't actually do that. Mm -hmm. And then later in life came back out and, or one of them was like, no, it was real, but we were being persecuted. So we decided that we didn't want to say anything. And I was like, oh my God, that probably happened all the time. Like, (laughs) ooh, I don't know. There were a lot of things in this book where I was like, even if it's not real, yeah. it felt real. And it's yes. the topic is something that is so um, how do I put this? It it's so real in the sense that 
it's really hard to straight up not believe in this stuff Mm -hmm. because it's so unknown Mm -hmm. that while you're reading things like this, it's hitting a part of you even if uh, consciously you're like, ghosts aren't real or you can't bring people out of a Ouija board or Mm -hmm. whatever. There's always a what if. Yeah. And that goes along with the next thing I was going to touch upon, which is they talk a lot about religion in this book and how like, There are a lot of characters in this book that don't believe in God or they're not religious, and yet they believe in the occult and they believe in ghosts and spirits. And so there is a lot of discussion about that, which I did think was interesting. And I think very of the time and even to this day, you know, there were a lot of issues touched upon in this book that you could tell, again, that Libba Bray did her research because that's why it felt so real even if it the stuff that wasn't even historically accurate felt so real because she slotted it in to everything that was real and even in her in her author's note she was like sometimes the scariest things are the things that humans actually do and come up with like the whole eugenics yep. display at the county fair <gasps> you know she said those yeah. signs were real yeah <laughs> big yikes yeah <laughs> Well, yeah, absolutely. And and I think that's the sign of a of a really good book is that there are elements of it that are make believe mm-hmm. or that are fiction, but it feels real to you because everything else is drawn from reality yeah. and is drawn from like uh from research and and references so that you can you can place yourself within this story mm-hmm. as a real human in the real world and then you can also believe the things that she's made up which is really amazing Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i'd be interested to try her other series even though i know like you said it's quite different but i'm like very curious because i I really liked her writing style and i thought she was very good (laughs) i really liked Mm -hmm. it yeah it's funny i reread those books the the great and terrible beauty a few years ago and i still am not like if i remember i'm like what what is it about? I don't even know. But it's more like Victorian era, like gothic, mm. spooky. Um, I think there's also ghostly things that happen. But it's not as... um, Like, I laughed a lot during reading The Diviners. I didn't laugh very much reading A Great and Terrible right. Beauty. It was more serious. Okay. But I remember really... I really enjoyed all of all of them. I think there's four of them, and I really enjoyed all of them. Jumping off of your brilliantly said point, Tilly... I have a quote I'd like to share to end this discussion, (laughs) if that's all right, Nikki. Yeah. (laughs) So this is near the end of the book as well, but Will is talking about the power of story. And he says, Mm -hmm. there is no greater power on this earth than story. People think boundaries and borders build nations. Nonsense. Words do. Beliefs, declarations, constitutions, words. Stories, myths, lies, promises, history. This and these, he gestured to the library's teeming shelves. They're a testament to the country's rich supernatural history. And Uncle Will is right. There is no greater power on this earth than stories. So thank you so much for listening to this episode of the BYOB podcast. If you enjoyed this and want to hear more from us, you can head over to our social media accounts to keep up to date on all things BYOB. We've got Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. Stay tuned after this to hear the first line of our next read and our final book of season two, the 2013 Pulitzer Prize winning literary novel, The Goldfinch by Donna Tartt. See you next time. And until then, keep on drinking in great stories. Cheers. Next time on BYOB, the Bring Your Own Book podcast. While I was still in Amsterdam, I dreamed about my mother for the first time in years. (laughs) 